Good evening. Thank you so much for joining Pepe's Bar. Pepe's Bar is um, my attempt to, to know a person better, to go deeper into the person and how the person is. And this evening we have Gita, Gita Glithart. And I'm very happy to, to have you to have you here. Thanks so much and welcome, Gita. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. It's good to see you. Good to see you. I'm I love you. So that's uh, that's uh, the, the the good thing about you know that. You know yeah. that. So I, I have today a Spanish wine. Uh, um, yes, open the bottle for I us. have a nice Coke, but I do have it in a crystal glass. So something. Yeah. I can I can recall who um, uh, gave me the bottle, but it's very nice. It's a very nice wine. So that that's good. So how are you? Maria? I am really really good. Yeah. Um, I have more headspace and more energy than I have had maybe the last five years. Um, oh. It um, it took a while for me to kind of figure out how well I was. It was like. I was sudden I was like, why am I running out of dishwasher tablets so fast? And I realized it was because I was using my dishwasher a lot more because I was starting to cook again. So not just oh. have easy solutions most nights, but actually preparing a meal. And, and when you prepare a meal, you use things. So my dishwasher was running all the time. So it started with things like that that I noticed. And I noticed that I do things faster like um i will empty my dishwasher faster i will fold my clothes faster i will i have energy to um read books i started re reading fiction again discovered uh, neil gaiman and i've read like eight of his books now um i started uh, having the energy to work on my sleep and uh, bringing it back on track it's kind of funny because you need energy, you get energy from sleeping, but you also need energy to kind of have take the effort to work on it. Um, yeah. So it's really good. Oh, happy, happy to hear. I mean, my, my mother um, died uh, two months ago, exactly two months ago. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And um, she cooked all the time and she was 99. So it, she missed it um, two months for a ton in 100, so she mm. cooked uh, 100 on 16th, uh, March uh, 16th, and um, she cooked all the time, even when she was old and not alone, she was cooking every day, because she said she needed to do that, just yeah. to uh, life going on, and, um, but she, um, so I bought a, for her an apartment, and um, with all the things you need, of course, and also with the dishwasher, and she never used the dishwasher, she said, <laughs> This uh, luxus, I don't need that. So, and for me, only for the few things. So, I'm always washing the things. So, yeah. and I, I can I can understand that because from from the kitchen, you could see the bay from Las Palmas. So it was uh, a little, yeah, that's nice. The, that's that's the thing. But the important thing for her was because she was living alone all the time, and um, that she needed to to cook, and and and, and that was um, a key a key thing. Mm -hmm. So what, what what do you cook? Um, so I, yesterday I just cooked chicken with some vegetables. I have been cooking Cajun tomato soup, which I haven't cooked. It's a recipe that I have from, I don't know, 20 years back, but I haven't cooked it for maybe five, 10 years. I've been doing a lot of dal. I've been making chili. Mm. Um, mm. Experimenting with actually putting lentils in my chili. Um, also experimenting with chilies, which was not as successful because it became very, very strong. <laughs> uh, but the lentils was a good idea. It um, it gave it a little bit more texture. Okay. Um, what else have I been doing? Pizzas. I made a potato pizza for the first time, so like a white pizza. Uh -huh. uh, I've never tried that before, uh, but it turned out it was super easy. Okay. Um, so you're not cooking the, the, the Scandinavian style of food? No, not really. Um, I, so like for the last years, I've just been cooking like chicken and vegetables, <clears throat> spaghetti bolognese or pizza. But okay. now I started, you know, doing more things. I, when I was younger, I cooked the traditional Danish things up until I was, I don't know, 28. Um, 
but the problem with that is traditional food in many countries, also here in Sweden, are meant for people working in the fields, doing hard manual labor. So it's not good for your weight. So when yes. I um, when I was young, uh, I think 28 or something, I decided I wanted to lose weight. And part of that was changing from the traditional Danish meals. And then I think I also got lazy at some point. I didn't, when I'm just cooking for myself, I don't find it as interesting to make the effort. Mm. Um, but also I don't cook a lot for others. Um, well, when I do, it's usually like a big portion of something because for me, the interesting part about having people over is the people. Yeah. My sister's super good at making interesting food and making the table look nice and stuff. Um, I'm not very good at that, but I'm good at uh, talking and um, having fun, playing games, all that stuff. I know. I know. Yeah, I mean, you are the host. No? You, yeah. you need, in, in the restaurant, you need the chef and you need the host. And yeah. you are the host. Yeah. No, I mean, <clears throat> and the same is in, in Germany, it's in Austria with the typical food. So, yeah. Uh, quite heavy and um and um i forget always because when i was skiing or i do snowboarding i i said okay i've been snowboarding so i can eat because i did sport yeah, yeah. and but then you know when i gain so much uh, weight all the time so it's not it's not but now nowadays the 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 new scandinavian cuisine is is light it's yeah. quite it is uh Nice. So I, I would love to, I was talking to my wife today and uh, telling her because um, on Friday, maybe we don't know yet if we go to Spain or to Italy. So we mm. we are struggling with which one we, we should go. And I said to her, should we go to Sweden? It's a little bit cold, but because my son is on, on uh, next week also in Sweden. Ah. And, and I said, ah, we can go there, but I think I have no chance. I would also wait until it gets a little bit warmer. I mean, we have had sun now for a few days, but it's really cold mm -hmm. still. Um, even though it's only around zero, it still feels very cold. But mm -hmm. I mean, like in summer and spring where you can just walk in the center and it's a little bit like, no, it's not like Venice, but there's like water everywhere. There's um, cozy buildings. It's just nice. And I like that you can walk around. Mm. Um, of course, if you want to go to some of the other museums, you have to go like outside town and yeah. take a bus or something. But in the middle, you can just walk around and it's just everything is very close. Yeah. I've been there for 100 years when I was a child. <laughs> no, yeah, when I was 22, something like that. Uh, so, that's I was... my first time was 2012. Yeah. So, before. Um, Yes, yeah, so I went here for, no, it was not, which one not, yeah, it was 2012. I was speaking at an internal IBM Ericsson conference um, in Stockholm. Uh, I was talking about agile transformations from a coach perspective. And I actually met um, who turned out to be a really good friend, uh, Henrik Essa, who was talking about it, um, transformation from an executive perspective. So he was an executive at Ericsson at that point. And we had exactly the same points. That one thing is, you know, figuring out how you want to do things. But then what really matters is trying it out and working on it and figuring out how it works. So the rolling out is actually the part that makes it stick. Mm. Um, and I still see today that, that companies are fighting with this. They, <clears throat> like they call McKenzie, they come in and they do this rollout of Agile in, in a month. And now everyone knows the theory, but to get it under your skin, it just takes a lot longer. Um, yeah, and then Henrik and I have been meeting here and there over the last, yeah, 12 years. Okay. Um, and it's just nice to have someone where you can, you know, talk about every day, but you can also talk about, you know, where is the identity of a human? Is it in your soul? Is it in your brain? Where is it actually? You know, you can talk about big things. Um, yeah, I mean, this I like is... Uh... This is a, a very interesting topic, you know? Yeah, it is. Um, you, can, you can spend uh, a whole night talking about that. Yeah. Mm. And we have. <laughs> so for the people who um, doesn't know you, who are you, Gita? 
Well, so I am um, a Danish woman. I moved to Stockholm I oh, seven years ago. That time flies. So I moved to Stockholm seven years ago. I came up here <clears throat> to work for a year um, as a consultant for Spotify. And after about six months, I well, my friends said to me, you are so much happier than I've seen you for a long time. And I took the step back and kind of reflected and realized that this is one of the first places where I feel at home. So I moved to Stockholm. Um, I've been working as an agile coach for many years where I work with organizations um, in the beginning, very much process oriented. How do you do Scrum or Kanban? Um, but over the last year, well, many, many years now, 12 years, I think, I started working more with people. And the last seven years, I've been working um, a lot with psychological safety. How do you introduce psychological safety in a team, in an organization? Um, and I've been working a lot with leadership, which is funny because I didn't realize that until um, I was looking for work. And a lot of the people who kind of reposted my, what do you call it, my LinkedIn post were talking about leadership. And I hadn't realized that I've been working so much with that. So I would say that I am on the, on the hard side of Agile, where it's not just processes, but it's actually about helping people to collaborate, to communicate, um, to create that safety and to be the best they can be. Um, yeah, I very often talk about the things we don't talk about. I talk about mental health, for instance. Um, last week, I just did a talk on imposter syndrome for a coding school in South Africa. Wow. That they, um, they start out with four months of Python and then they have a transition week where they invite people in for uh, Ask Me Anything. And uh, they would like, the students said, we would like to know more about imposter syndrome. And my friend is one of the people who is helping them with coding. So we said, well, do you have, um, do you have an hour for this? So I talked about imposter syndrome. And um, yeah, at the moment, I'm looking more into the leadership part and looking into the connections that are there, how it's all connected with the inclusion and psychological safety and leadership and taking responsibility. Because there's a lot going on where, I mean, for years, there's been like, we don't deem managers and agile. And we do. We just don't need them to manage people. We need them to lead people, take care of people. They manage projects and money and software and stuff that can be managed, but not people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I've been publicly speaking since 2013. Um, one of the places agile testing days, um, which I always love going to. And I love talking there as well. Um, See you next this year there. Yes, I will be there. I know. I know. So um, yeah, this year we're trying something new that will be interesting. So um, we're actually doing some team coaching this year, um, so that people who sign up as a team can get some team coaching. So I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to trying that out. Um, how 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 did your your career started? What did you study, or how how it started the, the way? Uh, well, so I am actually educated as a computer scientist. Okay. And well. I did my master thesis in computer network. So like, um, it's kind of funny because I took like the most, well, my master thesis in some of the most technical computer network stuff. But then I had a side topic of um, actually stream programming because this was before it was called Agile. So working on the stream programming, looking at how do you do knowledge transfer? Um, how do you lead a project? And when I came out, it was right after the dot com made everything crash. So I took whatever I could get and I started as a tester. Um, I never really learned much about testing at university, sadly. But no, I no. realized I was actually good at it because I see patterns. Um, and I'm very structured when it comes to testing. And gradually I found out that if we work on processes, we can prevent errors or bugs from coming in instead of figuring out if they're there. So that's kind of how I got my interest in processes. And another thing I realized, because I was in a company that had a very, let's say, strict process, very square, that I'm very good at understanding that, but then translating it, so to say, into something more pragmatic, more simple. 
Um, it's a skill I've had my whole life. So since I was five, I was helping like other people in my class because I was explaining things in a different way. And I think that's one of my kind of magical skills, I call it, that I can't go up and do like an academic talk. Well, I probably could if I wanted to. My talks are usually more on eye level with people because I find that, first of all, I am not better than them just because I'm on stage. I just know something different. Um, but second of all, people listen better when you are at the same level. Well, so I kind of found out that I wanted to work a little bit more with process, but I was still in testing. And then I, um, I went to IBM working on a big project that was closed down. And this one guy uh, who was running a project said, hey, um, I need testers. And I talked to him a bit and he's like, oh, you can do all this stuff. And I was like, okay, you're crazy. I can't do all this stuff. But I was like, okay, there's no other place to go. So I went there and he was right. Um, and I started learning more about Agile. Um, I got, I became a certified Scrum Master in 2007. Actually for in a cabin for a week with uh, four trainers and 11 participants. Um, and some of my colleagues were like, didn't you have any time off? for a week and I'm like I had a week off because I felt like it was a week off learning about agile became an agile coach once my project ended um because yeah well I was sick on sick leave with stress for 10 months when I came back to IBM my official title was still tester and they were like would you like to be a tester we have this project the developers are in a different country it's waterfall and I was like and the other option was to become a consultant as an agile coach. And I was like, uh, I have never been a consultant. I don't know how to be an agile coach, but it's better than being a tester at the end of a waterfall with people in a different country. So I said, yes. And um, I had to learn a few things about how to become a consultant. Um, I am not your typical IBM consultant. Um, and I realized that the things I use when I test it's like seeing patterns. And it's the same thing I do when I work with Agile. So even though I worked in healthcare with, with all the stuff I've learned so far, I could easily translate it to bank. Even though they were, so they were working with something totally different. That's kind of how I started as an Agile coach in 2010 and became independent in 2013. Uh, I left IBM because um, well, they had nice values on the wall, but I felt like they didn't matter inside IBM. What mattered was if you made money. Well, um, and 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 part of like my journey to becoming who I am now was figuring out how important values are to me. Mm. So, like helping the customer, for instance, was one of the values, um, and um, making good products. So, like basically, for me, like being decent to people. Showing yeah. respect for the client. And I mean, we sent someone in as an agile coach and all he did was take a Scrum Master certification. Mm. And to me, that was like, uh... and if they've been honest, if they said, you know what, we don't have anyone who has experience. We have this guy who has huge potential um, and we can send him in. Um, then I would, I would be okay with it. Mm. So I left and um, started my company, Native Wired. And I'm like native wired everywhere. Like uh, I'm still on Twitter a little bit because some people haven't left, but mostly I'm on Blue Sky. I'm on my company name. It's like everywhere um, you see native wired, it's usually me. Um, and the name is actually from the book um, Agile Coaching by Lisa Atkins. Okay. Um, there's a place in there where she writes about that people come in as an agile coach from many directions. Some come from developer, from management or whatever. And some people are natively wired. So it's like they, they do it by instinct because it's so deeply ingrained into them. Yeah. And that's how I work. I mean, I do learn things. And of course, that's why I have the instincts. But I feel like a lot of it just comes and I'm not sure where it comes from. I will ask a question and I don't know where that question comes from, but it often turns out that's the right question in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I chose the name Native Wired. I asked Lisa first if it was okay. Um, because I was like, even though, I mean, it's not 
like she owns the word, but I thought it would be nice and polite. So I think it is always nice to also to uh, for the people itself, not that they um, is uh, a kind of recognition that um, that you really read the book and yeah. understood and and you feel that this fits to you and you want to use it. And I yeah. think for the most of the people is is uh, it is very very nice. I mean the the, the thing working with customers a consultant is um, you um, I think most of the time you want to help them, mm. but they. Uh, want also to be helped, and yeah. um, and that's uh, that's the the thing where where you um, really um, yeah difficult. We have a customer now who wants to go from agile to um, waterfall back because they got a new CTO and he said till today that um, agile is shit, so he wants to go back. So, well, I mean. I think that many implementations of Agile is shit. Um, Agile started out as a way to create a good environment for developers and also making sure that we listen to the customers. And the first part of the Agile manifesto says we are uncovering. It didn't say we have uncovered the golden rules. It said we are uncovering while doing. So as we do things, we discover and too many ways that Agile gets introduced today is as a recipe. Mm. And that's not how it works. You can have a recipe if you want to do crocheting or knitting. Because those are things where you can follow it and be one way. When it comes to people and people interaction, and you just can't. First of all, it's not like you go to a training and then you know it all. You need to really build it in. Second of yeah. all... If you and I were to have a team, it would be different than if I had a team with Lena or a team with someone else. So I think that a lot of the Agile that, that is out there is actually quite rigid. And it's like, it's become ceremonies instead of actually being about values, about improving and about learning. Mm -hmm. um, and that's <clears throat> that. Yeah. Uh, how was, uh, uh, I mean, you study in Denmark, right? Yeah. Okay. So... I mean, Scandinavia may be different because I don't know, because I'm living in Germany for many years and, and I think uh, I have seen things happening here that I never have seen in Spain. So mm -hmm. on that, how is or how was, how is now in Sweden, but how was in Denmark at that time being a woman in this field? Was easy or was <sighs> not? It depends. It's actually quite interesting because I'm in an advisory board at my old university for computer science. And there's another woman. And she is very classically pretty, like blonde, uh, petite, um, like classically pretty. And she really struggled. People did not take her seriously. People, the guys did not want to have them in their working group. Um, and she's been fighting and fighting and fighting and I was one of the guys um, but I mean until my last year I don't think any of the, my, my fellow students had seen me in a dress mm. uh, I mean I made them almost fall off their chair when we went to the graduation party because normally I would be like in t-shirt hoodie jeans and not you know not anything fitted just plain and, and usually geeky t-shirts and then when we had the graduation party, I had bought like a full ball gown. My friend had put my hair up with like tiny, tiny, tiny um, things that so looked like a tiara. And I had hair down to here, which I would normally always have in a bun. And, and my fellow students were just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my but God. So I, didn't, I didn't struggle with it, but I. Actually. Last year or the last, so 21 and 22, was the first time in my life where I met the part about, I will talk about something technical. And it's like, I'm speaking into a void because I'm a woman. Hmm. So I know many of my, my friends who are women have tried this, but I have never tried it before. I, I was deeply shocked. And mm -hmm. also because mostly when I hear about these things, it's from like your peers or um, maybe someone who has a lower rank than you. I don't like that term, but like, and I did not meet that at all. I, um, 
the people I was a manager for and some of the people I was not a manager, some of the developers said, it's so nice to have one who really knows tech. Because even though I haven't coded for a long time, I know how it works. I know mm -hmm. the process. I know how people think. I know how you need to structure code and such. And experiencing that some people did not listen to me because I was a woman was, um, I don't know, what it, it took a while before I discovered it because it was so unfamiliar. And I have a really good friend who worked with me. And so we agreed that he would repeat what I said. And so he did that for a while. And every time it was a super good idea. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck you. Um, so I have been lucky. Um, well, some people say I've been lucky. But some people also say that I have a little bit of a badass attitude um, when it comes to um, protecting people or um, people saying stuff to me. Um, so it was very interesting when Me Too started happening because women contacted me and asked to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And after like the third woman that I didn't know when I talked to her, I'm like, why did you contact me? And she's like, because you don't take any shit. I mean, when, um, I think the in in your case, when when I see you, no, and um, I um, I have seen many times. Yeah, I like very much strong women, and I love to work with strong women. I I when when you lead, I follow you mm. because if you so I I don't look here also for men, but also for women. So if I don't have. A, I prefer to work with women than with men because uh, it's more easy, easy in the sense that it's clear to to follow. Okay, yeah. so I don't to, to measure anything. And um, and you are strong. You are strong. And and also not only on, only on the stage, but also when and when you talk to people, mm -hmm. you see that um, you are. On, um, I mean, you you are there. So that and, and I think that the people, uh, especially the women. Um, uh, uh, see that, and and um, and that's good. Good to hear that they are coming to you. Yeah, I mean, some of my male friends is like, say you are very present, you are confident. Yeah. What is your peer confident, and you look at people. So, if you are walking down the street, I will look at people. I won't look away, which a lot of people do. So it's also this kind, of, and I don't accept any shit, so to say. Um, I've been in places where I've been broken, where my psyche has been broken, and I didn't. I was so broken that I didn't fight anymore. But most times, I will speak up, and yeah. I will, even if it has the consequence of getting me fired. I don't care if people are doing something that's not fair. Like, so I'm in this advisory board, like I said, at university, and one of the things we've been talking about a few times is how do we get more women to apply for computer science. We were two women there, a professor and me, and um, we were talking about these campaigns that used to be there in Denmark. And both she and I were like, we don't like these campaigns. It's kind of like they tell you, you have to be perfect and be a mother and code and bake and blah, blah, blah. Um, we don't find them appealing. And then this one guy, what he meant to say was, since you studied computer science, these campaigns are not targeted at you. What came out of his mouth was, since you're not real women, this campaign is not targeted at you. Mm. And I just went like click and my voice was, I didn't raise my voice. It was ice cold. And I talked to him for 10 minutes and the rest of the room was just quiet. And mm. I told him exactly what I thought about co not co saying that I'm not a real woman because I'm in IT. Mm. Uh, because I've heard it before. It's like, oh yeah, women are not logical. No humans are logical when it comes to that, but women are just as logical as men. There are men that are logical, there are women that are logical, there are men that are not, there are women that are not. But I got so yeah. angry, but when I get that angry, I am just like, mm. I have to lava, yeah. lava with ice on the outside. <laughs> when when I studied computer science, um, 1991 mm -hmm. and so on, when I start in my um, class, were five women, 
two from Germany and three from Iran. Mm. And um, all of them were very good. Yeah. And there was uh, one, especially from Germany, who was um, top. Was She was always writing, a, uh, in Germany, it's a one, it's a, yeah. a, a or whatever. And, um, and she was very good. But then the reality at the end, when you finish, um, I mean, um, things happen. No? And um, for example, myself, you know, I am from Spain. Uh, I'm not blonde and it's difficult. So I remember that I, I need to write over 100. Uh, I apply for 100 companies to get a job. Yeah. Then at the end, I, I got one. Uh, the police so it was difficult for me but for her being a woman and from, even from germany was worse so she couldn't start work as computer scientist no she she couldn't find a job so at the end she worked in in a call center yeah the last time i met her 20 years ago okay I mean, so this is getting better it's um, the time today is different of course but but it's not that different. i think the problem is um that we do know how to get women in but we're not very good at keeping them yeah there's a little bit too much and uh, not taking responsibility for you what you do like going oh can we tell a joke anymore yes you can tell a joke but if it hurts someone say you're sorry and don't say i'm sorry that you're hurt say i'm sorry that i said that don't make a non-apology and mm. Going into that defensive thing where people just go like, "Oh, it's also it's a oh, it's about you." Like, I once was telling someone off for calling me uh, like a bunch of women guys, and I don't mind it that much. But I've I've begun to kind of be more aware of it because it hurts some women and some non-binaries that were called guys. And he became really really upset, and I shouldn't like call him out in public and stuff like that. And became all about how I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. um and i still see this and and i mean i think i just saw some who most of them made a report that it will take 130 years before we have equality between men and women yeah and i mean it's yeah. it's, it's, it's difficult you see that um, still today i um um it's difficult because the society and you see that um, even the young people, um, when I say, oh my God, I don't know why I am so and why you are so, because you should move in the right direction. Yeah. And, um, but it's, the thing is, what you said, how to, uh, to move women to, um, to be in, in the profession. But you see, for example, for ourselves, we try, we still keep mm -hmm. trying, uh, for the conference to uh, to bring women to speak yeah. because there are and there are many of them who can speak and they are as good as men they are also bad as men uh, as so yeah, every, yeah yeah it's not like everything. we're perfect just because we're women everything is there so yeah. but um, but the thing is that um men from the culture part i think we think always that we are special yeah we can say everything so yeah. we can do anything so and and uh, women they um, think twice or three times uh, may i say that yeah. i am able to talk or um, it's important what i am saying or is, is the and, and and i think we need to um, this our i think the chance that we have not only ourselves but also um, other uh, conference organizer that they try to to get um, women into that, and yep. uh, so I am planning um, uh, a new conference, but I cannot tell that uh, it's secret. And no, I won't uh, tell anyone. And uh, yeah, please. And um, so we um, yesterday we were talking about the keynotes, and um, and uh, we are going to have there also. It's a different topic, and mm -hmm. and. That's and we are going to have there, of course, uh, more women uh, keynote in than uh, than men because uh, that's uh, that's the aim. You know? And um, and I think that um, in my experience, we need to fight. We need to to convince them 
uh, even their story is important. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, but things like um, you do because you you also um, how do you say it in English? You um, uh, help um, people in their career when they have yeah. problems. You have uh, things like Elisa Crispin, uh, Jana Gregory, uh, yeah. Alex. Um, there are many people helping. A woman helping a woman, yeah. but also uh, there are men who, who are helping women too. And I think we need we need that. We need um, there is a lot of work there. Mm. There is a lot of work, and I think I mean, I think that we also talk about you know how men, like you say, it's a little bit like the joke is like if there are ten things for a job at, a man will say, yeah, I know four, I'll be good, and the woman will be like, okay, I only know ten, so I'm not good. Um, and there's a little bit to that, um, and research shows that not just women, but the ones who are not, like, uh, if you are black in a white community, for instance, you will have the same. So the writing without bullet points will help. But I think the thing we're also forgetting is that while men have that privilege and they are able to speak and they will say, yes, I'll do a keynote, where a woman will go like, I'm not sure I can do that. The other side of that coin is that we... Don't often allow, like the, the same thing, the same culture that trains men to know they can do anything also trains them to having to be strong. And um, and I, there's this movement in Denmark, um, like a male movement, where one of the things they are doing is they actually have like trainings for men on how to um, flirt with women without being possessive. Because there's this whole thing about, oh, and now you need consent, and how do I do that, and can I even do anything? So there hasn't been done a lot of work for the guys either on how do they fit in. So so this group is actually, so they're, they're saying, like, we want equality for men and women. And one of the ways we can help men is, or women is to help men also um, be more open, um, learning more about themselves, reflecting and we will help both parties by doing that. Uh, so I think there are some places where, where good work is being done. And I, um, I see yeah. men, it's kind of funny because I've seen this in the IT industry for a long time. I was just reading a Danish newspaper and this guy from a company in Denmark was saying, I'm not going to speak at another conference if there are no women there. Yeah, of course. And he says, that's how we can do it. And it was funny because it was like a brand new thing in, in that industry. Um, but at least he's doing it, and he's in the newspaper for it. Um... I mean, it's, it's uh, but the thing is, um, for example, it depends always. Um, I mean, I am uh, I am a very strange person, so I I, I cannot count into uh, not in into my generation, not in 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 the field, nor as as an entrepreneur, because I'm I'm completely different. Because I grew up with women. And I, uh, my, um, the women in my family are very strong, and uh, the men are supportive. They are not, um, they are not um, in the way that they said, okay, the, I'm better, whatever. So no. they, 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 they are partnering really with their wives, and um, and um, so that's why for myself, it's it's quite difficult. Um, um, the discussion because I, I, there are things that I don't see because I, oh. for me, you are the same uh, as I am. So there is no uh, things. And for example, um, this is interesting when when I see I have a daughter, uh, she's now eighteen, uh, old age, whatever, and and, and you see that um, uh, even she grew up with me. So um, my influence is uh, quite quite little. Yeah. compared to the influence outside yeah. okay especially because she's living the most of the time by her mother mm -hmm. and and um, and um so let's see how this uh, goes but for example as as um, in a company i think we have uh, more or less the num the same number of uh, women and men working yeah. in my company and we have um, um a lot of consultant as a woman in in my company and I do not care if uh, they get pregnant. I do not care. I, they, they, I always said the only condition is not that's that's I don't get the father again. So you can get <laughs> you want, you get the support. Uh, 
I don't care. So uh, I do care, of course. Yeah, I, yeah, but I know what you mean. Yeah. I, what I don't want is that the career or the work is is really a constraint to become yeah. a mother. And um, and so we need to deal with that, of, 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 with that, of course, as, as a company. But it's an important thing. And I remember last year uh, when I had a, when we have the open air. Um, um, the CEO, a woman CEO from, from another company, told me, you know, we just hire a, a pregnant woman. I said, wow, that's that's very nice. I really I, I like that. You know, yeah. I did that already ten years ago. I said, well, yeah, ten years ago I hired a woman who was pregnant. Yeah, because you know the society needs uh, kids. Yeah, and if if the people want to have a kid. Why not? I mean, we are a company, and the thing is that I, uh, when the, when the people do not believe, I, I mean, my colleagues know that I am, uh, I am a, a, a poor sock. <laughs> I don't care about the money, so I don't care about the money. So it's, it's um, the good thing, yeah. And uh, but I understand that not everybody, not every company. And uh, not every woman are in the position to to move in in the way. That's why um, I think that they need some kind of safety, yeah. you know, to to go in this direction, right? But I was also I was just reading um, in the Guardian an English newspaper about how they don't have enough childcare, which means uh, that somebody has to stay home with the kid if you are not able to pay for a nanny. And in London, it's getting so expensive that most people can't afford to pay for it. And that also means that someone needs to stay at home. In most countries, the man is the one making the most, so the woman will stay at home. Um, so there are all these these things built in. Um, and I mean, there are also, I mean, some women are also like, I need to take care of the kid because I'm the woman and I know how. And I think that some of the things that they are doing now in EU with having part of the parental leave for the man, and if he doesn't use it, it's gone. I think that's a good thing. Um, it's been like that in Sweden since, I think, the 80s. But yeah. interesting enough, with corona um, and the little bit of crisis that we have in Sweden, um, it is going a little bit back again. So fewer men are actually taking parental leave now. Oh, um, It used to be... 24% when I came up here, the 24% of the whole leave was taken by men, and often when the child was small, whereas now it's 22%. I mean, okay, it's not but much, but there's still a difference. In Germany, it's maybe one digit, maybe, yeah. I don't know, because even my company, the, the men normally uh, don't do that. and uh, But the women um, do that, of course. And in Germany, it's very nice because you can be... You're gonna stay at home till three years. Oh, yeah. And, and um, the, the most of them they take one year or more than one year, uh, a little more than one year. And uh, because the first years paid was quite nicely, I mean yeah. nicely. Yes, uh, not compare with the money you were earning before, but um, I think you get seven hundred euros or whatever, so that it helps a little bit. Yeah. And uh, and of course uh, the things with the kindergarten in, in Germany. Um, it's also not that good, but possible. Yeah. Okay. And um, but I found my own kindergarten uh, twenty-one years ago for my kids. So <laughs> I solved the problem in that way. <laughs> it was like I was talking to uh, what's with just last name from Menlo Inc., and they yeah. actually have kids at work. So he's from the U.S. And he had this really good developer and she got a kid and then she came back to work. And after, I think, a month, he said, I'm sorry, I have to quit because I I need to, I can't find someone to take care of my kid. And he was like, why don't you bring the kid to work? As, as Kind of as an experiment. Um, and he was he said he was a little bit worried about, you know, will it take all the time? But what happened was actually that it kind of became the team taking care of the kid. So... Yeah. It wasn't a problem, and often when he's really tall and he has like this deep voice, so often kids will become very calm when they're with him. So he will often be seen go walking around with a kid, and he says it might, you know, cost a little bit of focus and concentration, 
But what I get is I get awesome people who can work and who are happy. And if they're happy, they work better. Yeah. So all in all, you know, it's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, um, we have experienced that also in the company that you can bring your kid and so on and people bring when they need it. Yeah. And, and the thing is that, uh, of course, uh, the kid is like, uh, you know, everybody wants to have the kid. So yeah. because especially the woman, they, they want oh, a kid and so on. And it's always nice. But also, it's not only uh, the kids. I mean, um, we cannot make comparison. Yeah. But uh, also there, um, people bring the dog or, yeah. or whatever. So that's, um, that's also not, not a problem. So when, <clears throat> um, so helping women and, and trying to, to be there. So how was for you in the moments where you were in the situation where you said, oh shit, um, there are some doubts there. Um, did you have these moments in the past that where you said, oh, I had many doubts. I mean, up until 2011, so 13 years ago, I did not have a lot of confidence. Well, that somehow I knew that I was, like logically I knew I was good at my, at my craft and skills like that. But it wasn't until after that that I started really building proper confidence. And I still have sometimes when I fall into this trap of like, oh, I don't know how to do anything. Um, I mean, like at the moment, the market is shit um, for consultants, especially for agile coaches and leadership coaches. And I go between, well, actually, I, if you asked me in like October, I would be like, yeah, I'm not very good at my job. Nobody knows what I'm doing. I don't know how to sell myself. You know, I should find something else. Um, it's my own fault. Whereas after like starting in December, I would be like, it's not a very good market. I need to make an extra effort, but I'm still good at what I do. Um, so I go into these times where I go like, I don't know how to do anything. And that's why, and, and one of the things I've learned is that what I'm not good at is promoting what I do because I haven't had to. I've been super spoiled that since, so I struggled to find work in the beginning of 2014. And since then, I haven't struggled until last year. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to take a month's break. I should, I should get to work. I write on Twitter or LinkedIn. I get a job. Uh, because people knew of me. Um, so I haven't had to, you know, do marketing. I haven't had to update my web page. Um, and yes, when, when I didn't get a job or get consulted geeks or, you know, do talks and that pay in companies, for instance, or workshops, in the, I doubted myself so much. Mm. Um, but part of it was also that I had become a little bit broken, mm. influenced by people who did not respect me for my craft, mm -hmm. because I was not someone who worked in Spotify for 10 years, um, and or worked in another of the big companies for 10 years. And it was like, my 10 years of knowledge of how do you implement things in an organization and implement change does not matter anything compared to someone who worked in another organization. As no matter what, it didn't matter. And mm. I became invisible, which also meant that I started doubting everything that I did. Um, and it took I'm me a while to realize that. Yeah, the, I mean, the problem is when you are um, good at the things that you're doing, so you don't need marketing, so you're yeah. getting at the things, and then and, um, there's a problem when suddenly things happen and people are not contacting you for yeah. a product. And we know that. So we still today, we don't have really a salesperson in the company till today. No. So normally the customer come in yeah. and there are where we uh, need to ask partners, hey, do you have a project? Because we have someone in the bench. Yeah. And, and then um, we need to sell the person. Because normally, even when I started the, the company, uh, was the thing that the, the CAO of a bank, where I was working, uh, started working, when I found the company, that when they had a meeting with new projects, 
um, this um, uh, CEO said uh, to the project leader, ask uh, Mr. Diaz uh, to do that. Yeah. Okay. So the project leader came to me and said, Mr. Diaz, you have 700 days for that project. Mm. So look. So nice. That's, that's, that, that was yeah. so, and um, that was uh, the crazy time. Uh, nowadays it's uh, harder. There's also more people outside, of course. Yeah. And um, but we don't doubt uh, about the things that we can do. So we no. know that. I mean, we are in the business for 26 years, so we know what we do. Like you know what you do. So yeah. there's no doubt. But it's also interesting, like because one of my expertises has become psychological safety. Um, I wrote a part in a book. Uh, like I had a really good workshop like three weeks ago, and what people really liked about it was that it was. They said, what surprised them was that it was slow but that meant that they could dive in and they didn't feel like it was too slow it wasn't boring it was just like you could take it in um and i was talking to one of my friends about it and he said well you have this niche and you're really really good at this the problem is that um god and his uncle and everyone is talking about psychological safety and for the people buying it it's really yeah. hard to tell who can actually do this because one thing is speaking at um conference for instance another thing is coming in starting to work with people um so it, i actually got a workshop last year because they bought in this guy who'd written two books about it um and they had him out and talked to them and then after that they went like yeah very interesting theory um now what and then one of them knew me and said well i know this i know this person and she is much more pragmatic and much more about how do we do things so I got a job because of him, because he was too theoretical. Um, but it's still like for someone who is like buying trainings, how do you see that this one is someone who can actually implement it properly compared mm -hmm. to someone who has taken a training or, you know, um, doesn't have the instinct for creating safety? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult for people to see. Yeah. When, when, when times are tough, do you have a friend where, um, or a person where you can go and talk? Yes. I mean, I have a lot of good friends. Um, and so like when I'm in Denmark, um, I stay with my best friend. I have a room in their house. When they bought the house they have now, they actually bought it with a room for me. Wow. Um, and like they're more family than family. And when I'm there, I'm home, which means that I... I'm not a guest. I'm not taking special care of. Um, I do chores as well. Uh, like I do laundry, for instance, um, because that's one of the things I like to do. Um, but I can talk to them. And even if they, they're busy. So one of the things that happened when I was home shortly in, um, in the beginning of November, because my uncle died and I had to go to a funeral. And I was talking to my friend about not feeling well. And she's like, well, go up and fix what you need to fix. And then you come home and you stay. So I stayed home for six weeks from wow. all of December and part of January. And even though we didn't talk, you know, sometimes we talked, but sometimes we would just like be in the same room. There would be someone, there would be someone who actually planned dinner. Even if I made it, there was someone else who planned it. Um, so I do have friends like that. I have friends that I can call and talk all night. <laughs> um, I have friends where I can write everything is terrible. I'm not very good at anything. And they will write to me that they love me and that this will also pass. And um, I survived every day so far. Um, so I have a lot of good friends and some that are almost more than friends. Mm -hmm. um, can, I mean, can you be alone? Yes, I can. When I'm feeling really, really bad, I don't like being alone, but then I don't contact people because I don't want to be a bother. Um, when I'm feeling good, I don't have a problem with being alone. I mean, sometimes I fall into the, oh, I'm going to die alone and I don't have anyone um, trap. Um, but most of the time I'm okay on my own, especially like the better I feel, the more I'm okay on my own. Um, but which is funny enough, because that's also when I have the energy to meet people. So I do meet people more. Um, so like, I mean, like, like I said in the beginning, I'm feeling so much better. So the last 
But since I came home in the beginning of January, I haven't felt alone, even though there can sometimes be weeks where I don't talk to friends and just chat with them. Um, but also, I mean, I chat with people. My be- my friends that I stay with, their kids are my kids. And sometimes I will like um, get a text from the girl. So she's 22 now and she'll be like, oh, I just want to say I love you. Um, and, you know, so I have these magical people in my life. That's nice. This yeah. is, is, is this a kind of blessing in your life? It is. I mean, mm. having people who are like this, but also people, like I met one of my friends, Torpion, today, and he's very, very close, but he's also, which also means that he can say when he doesn't have the energy for it. He doesn't pretend that he's feeling well enough to meet up if he's not. Mm. Um. And we have this thing where, like, when we meet, we hug for very, very long. And it's like we create this bubble of love where there's nothing else. Um, and, and he's been a great help for me. Like, when I started learning how to say no, he was my, he gave me permission. So, like, if I knew I had to say no to something, but I didn't feel like it was, I could do it, I would talk to him and say, hey, is it okay if I say no to this? And he would say, yes, you can. And then I could say no. So even though logically it's not him giving me permission, he has been that help. Yeah, so. I mean, it's always difficult. Yeah. No, I mean, this is, um, I mean, um, I'm also not so good at saying no. I mean, they, my my colleagues know that. They ask me for anything and I always say yes. Yeah. And my wife comes and says, why? I say, why not? <laughs> but I think it's natural. I mean, especially if you are a kind person, you want to help others. Yeah. And sometimes we forget that um, we can help too much. Mm. Yeah. I was just doing this talk for mentors, um, mm. some people who are so it's here in Stockholm and they are mentoring Ukrainians to help them get a job, the ones who choose to stay. And what they sometimes forget is that if you do a thing for a person, they don't learn how to do it. So sometimes say, saying no and not set, and setting boundaries can actually prevent the other person from learning or taking the option away from them. Yes, yes. Uh, so sometimes that helps. Hard, me. It's, it's hard to see um, how they fail because the thing is that you can give them some hints or whatever, yeah. especially for for the kids. Um, not even for not only for the kids, but. Um, um, I mean, um, even if you mean that in the right way and you want to help the people and uh, the things are based on your experience, okay, and, um, but they don't believe it, no. okay, <laughs> and the thing is, that's okay, yeah. and then they fail, and the problem is when they fail, um, if there are big things, then um, the consequences are also big, yeah. And and uh, that's it. But uh, but then I um, and and I'm very good on that. So for for myself, and um, if I tell you the things once or twice, if you don't do it, that's fine with me. So I, yeah. after that, when you fail, then said okay, yeah. That's it. That that's the important thing. So in 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 that sense, um, if you look back to Gitte when Gitte was 16, 18, 20 or whatever. So um, do you have a recommendation for her? Oh, yes. I mean, so much when I look back, it almost feels like I was, uh, it was not me. Um, In which I sense? Would, like when I was 16, when I was 20, I did not believe in myself at all. If something happened, I would believe that it was my fault to the point where I knew it was my fault. So I would never get angry because if something went wrong, it was my fault. So I was blaming myself a lot. I was, um, um, I didn't speak up. I didn't, I didn't laugh out loud because what if somebody noticed me? Um, and I wish I could tell her that she's okay. I wish I could tell her that she's loved and that 
with all the imperfections she has, she's still perfect. And who she are, who she is, or who she was, is okay. Mm-hmm. And and make her believe that, which is the hardest part. Um, make her believe that she's more than having good grades in school. And that she deserves to be taken care of as well. I wish I could do that. But then part of why I'm so good at sensing people is because I wasn't taken properly care of, so I have to take care of myself. And which means I trained my instincts to listen very carefully to people and sometimes hear what they're not saying. So I wouldn't be who I am today if if I had not gone through all those things. Is it easy to to close the past? I mean, with the, because all of us are carrying our rucksack full of, of, of stones, and um, and it's easy to accept the past. Not always. Um, slowly and gradually accepting the past. Um, Accepting that that's where I was and I did the best I could with the options I had. Um, I had like a big breakthrough in 2004 when I was talking to a therapist. And she said to me, you are very strong. And I was like, wait, what? Because I always saw myself as weak. And she's like, you come from a family where nobody has any education. And you took two university degrees. You have a job as a woman in IT. Um, you have a career. You are very strong. You did all these things without support from home. And that was the first time for me, like, like, like oh, wait, I am, wait, I'm not weak. Because I always saw myself as weak. So I think that bit by bit, learning more about taking responsibility for my life, that there are options and you can choose options. It, each option has a consequence, but we have so much, so many more options than, than we think. And that we don't have to fit in the box that people want to put us in. No. Like when I started having my own company and being independent, people were like, oh, so you're going to be a consultant to be rich. And I'm like, no, I'm going to be a consultant so I can have my freedom. Yeah. Um, so that I can say yes or no to a client. So that I can decide which conferences I go to, so that I can take two months off if I have the money for it. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. yes, if some of my friends who did this, like were working, like one of my friends, he would get up at like five in the morning and prepare something that he had to do in the evening, and then he would go to work all day and do something in the evening until he had a million in the bank, because before that he felt like he couldn't breathe. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more like, I mean, yes, money is nice, it can buy you nice stuff. But I have food, I have clothes, I have an apartment. If everything fails and I don't have any money, I will sell my apartment and move to Denmark until I'm back on my feet. I mean, I don't need a fancy car. I don't need to go to to Thailand on vacation twice a year. I, I need to do stuff that makes me happy and that helps. Make the world better for people. Mm. And that's why I'm independent, so that I can make those choices. Yeah. How, how, how was your childhood? Rough. Um, uh, my mom was an alcoholic. And um, I was the oldest, so I took care of a lot of things. When um, my parents got divorced when I was nine, and we moved, uh, actually, away, we moved from Denmark to Belgium for two years. And I tried to take care of everything, make sure everything was okay. Um, and I mean, now I think when I look at it back and with the knowledge I have now, my, prop, my mother probably had some kind of mental problem, like, uh, I don't know, borderline or something. So I did not get support. I was always told that I was sloppy and ugly and I didn't do things right. Um, I would take care of the cleaning. I would try to make sure that my sister didn't discover things. Um, and then at the same, I mean, I well, she always made sure there was food in the house, but sometimes, you know, I had to cook it. Um, 
but I didn't get support. And I never got praise. I always got told that I'm not, if something wasn't perfect, I got told that I was got, not good enough. If it was perfect, I wasn't told anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's also, I mean, that's why I grew up thinking that it was all my fault and that I didn't have value, except maybe if I got good grades. Um, so in that way, it was rough. Um, and I survived it. And I mean, for years, my sister and I thought that I had kind of taken the whole load. And it wasn't until she got older, when she got this coach, that she realized that there were so many things that had affected her as well. Mm-hmm. That maybe I'd taken some of the things, but I couldn't take everything. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and that meant that, you know, I was... Um, I'm very good at watching people because I was watching how the mood would change with my mom and other people around it. I would take care of people because that's how I felt I had value. Mm. Um, and I would always try to be the best. Um, so like studying hard. Um, so the first time I flunked a subject when I was at university, I was devastated. I didn't even know that could Happen. So I was like, if I'm not the smart girl, who am I? Like my whole identity went away. Um, and I mean, I passed the subject later. I got super good grades. I was um, the second best in my year. Um, the guy I wrote my master thesis was what's his first best. So uh, we were kind of like a tiny bit geeky on the project. But um, so my childhood was rough and I didn't know a lot of people which is kind of funny because now i know i my sister's like how can you even keep all those people apart and i mean i have of course i have levels of friends there are people who are like deeply close and there are people that are friends but that i i that we don't call each other when we meet we have a nice time but i know so many people now and like i'm going to speak in denver uh in october and I was like, oh, I wonder which indigenous people are around there because I was fascinated by the Navajo. I've been that since I was young. Uh, my dream catcher is actually made by, like, brought in a Native American shop made by proper Native American Navajo. Um, and I was talking to one of my friends, and she's like, well, why don't you come stay with me for a week? It's a one-hour flight, and we have Navajo country right next to us. I can take you there. And by the way, I have a room and you can borrow my car. Wow. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but I've, nice. had that, I've had that before. Once I wrote on Twitter, do I know anyone in New York who has a sofa? Because I was going there for the first time and I realized that I wasn't making that much money. And I realized that a hotel room was like $350 per night. And I was like, fuck. And this woman that I met once at a conference wrote to me, well, we have a guest room. So I stayed with them for five days. Um, And I mean, there are so many kind people in the world and so many people I know that even though we met once, you know, we know each other. And maybe it's also with the conferences I go to, the on-conferences I go to, they are filled with these people, people who care properly. Experiences there is um, with people, you connect with them. And then there's no problem. They can be at your home and they can... So on and the other people that you meet them but that's fine that's yeah. uh, nice people that you don't n- there is no in my ha- in, in in my uh, case it's not really a hard uh touch so no. no that and that's the thing yeah so uh, how much do you think do you have a scandinavian genes in you i mean the influence of scandinavian uh, genes oh, or yeah. are they are, are, are Denmark's are, are, are dance uh, people different than the other ones? Well, I think every culture is different. I, well, actually, so my mom was adopted. And the story she told was that her mom was a maid and got pregnant by a sailor. So in that way, I always thought it could be fun to look at my genes. But <laughs> I'm very much a product of, or I was very much a product of Danish culture. Um. Being a woman, being in Jutland, where I don't think you're anything special, 
um, don't speak up, don't be noticed. Um, very much a product of that when I was younger. And that also kind of made me try to fit in all my time. Like until I met the Agile community in 2011, I'd always tried to fit in. Like I love dragons, for instance, but then I had like one dragon book and I had a tiny Yoda. And it wasn't until I kind of found out that, whoa, I'm not alone. There are other people who are, who love dragons and who talk about Star Wars or, you know, listen to children's books because they're amazing. And now I like, I have a collection of Yodas. I even have a Swarovski, I can't say that, Swarovski crystal Yoda. Wow. Which is like one of the most expensive things I ever bought, but it's amazing. Um, <laughs> and yes, it's super geeky, but that is who I am. And I embrace who I am. Mm. When, when, when you compare the, um, the society in Denmark and now the society in, in Sweden, what are the differences there? So are there? Are there the, differences? Oh, oh yeah, I, I'm actually, it's kind of surprising that you are so close and there's such a difference. Like in Denmark, they kind of say that they're tolerant, but they're kind of only tolerant within this box. In Sweden, they're much more tolerant. Like some of the things I noticed when I was starting to come here was Like I saw more uh, men holding hands, um, like couples. Um, going into the ABBA museum for just me and my friend and her daughter, we got a family ticket. And nobody even questioned that, that we were a family. Um, and I think to some extent, Sweden is more open, but they're also very good at thinking that they're open. And it's a little bit like 10, 15 years ago, Sweden was super progressive. They were way ahead of other people. They have a, like a pronoun that is neutral, for instance. There were a lot of things. But it's a little bit like they got stuck there and they, they need to move on. But another interesting part is that in Denmark, it's very much about like having majority and figuring things out. Sweden is much more about having consensus and everyone agreeing. Yeah. Um, and that can drive me nuts sometimes because you, then that means you have to ask every single person. Um, that, that also means that I drive people nuts because I want to move on. Um, but I there have is, I have there is Sorry. conflicts in, in Sweden. So, because I have a very good friend uh, of mine, he's from Sweden and he, he's married with a German, uh, where they are not married, they're living together for yeah. one and a half years too. And she said he cannot fight. It's no. not, uh, no conflict. So that's, it's like. Because they like harmony. Yeah. Exactly. They try not to have conflicts until they explode. So when they have conflicts, they're usually huge because it's like you build it up inside. And then at some point. Um, oh. But like culturally, what I was um, one of, I was talking to this guy who had looked into it and he had been to this lecture about cultures. And he said, like in Denmark, we are a sailing people. We would take a boat, we would sail to places, stuff like that, which is a very independent form. Even yeah. if you're a farmer, you could be very independent. Sweden is a country where there's a lot of rock, for instance, like mountains and stuff. If you had to do something there, you needed everyone to pitch in. You needed to agree on where you were going. So okay. like even the landscape kind of contributed to Sweden having to, okay, we need to agree and have harmony because We're kind of stuck here. Where well, Denmark's a little bit more like, yeah, okay, we have majority, and if I don't like it, I'm just going to sail away. And that <laughs> is kind of a little bit stuck still in, in the culture. Um, which, of course, I'm trying to change. I mean, I don't, I don't feel Danish. I, if I feel anything, it's European. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm... I mean, I don't fit in in Denmark. I... I'm a little bit an outsider, um, but then I'm an outsider in a lot of places because I like, I think it's stupid to say, okay, I'm not going to read this book because it's for kids. If it's a good book. Like I'm listening to How to Train Your Dragon, which are good books. They are like for 13, 16 year old. They're super funny. Like, <laughs> why should I have this facade of, hey, I'm a grown up. I don't do that. Which is, What do you do in Denmark a lot? But at the same time in Sweden, I'll be like, 
if you and I, if I feel like you and I have a problem that you've been, something's going on, I will contact you and saying, Hey, Pepe, um, um, is there something going on? Have I hurt you or something? Because I feel like your answers are very short and snappy. And then we talk about it while we have a tiny conflict. Um, so I'm trying to train the Swedes into doing that as well, but it will take time. <laughs> yeah. But you have time. You have, I have time. time. All the time in the world. Yeah. So we are at the end of the first bar and have, like always, some special questions for, uh, for the Pepper's Bar. And um, the first one is uh, what is your favorite drink? If you have one. If it's like an alcoholic drink, I would say a good gin and tonic. Okay. Um, when I'm in Denmark, so I'm the husband of the family, sometimes when we, when we cook, which means I look at him while he cooks, he will like pick a particular gin. He will take the glass. He will you know, put a lemon around. He will pick a specific tonic. That or port wine, I would say. Oh, like nice. tawny, a good dark port wine. Not bad. What is your favorite song at the bar or in the bar? The mm. eneste hun ville var danse. It's a Danish song from my favorite band that I've been following in for almost 40 years now, 38. And they have the song that came out in the 80s called All She Wanted Was To Dance. Uh -huh. And it's about being at a party and actually wanting to enjoy life and just dance with your boyfriend but everyone has this facade and pretending that they're talking about something important and she ends up dancing on her own and disappearing into the night so it's also sad but it is it has been my song since i don't know 90 1990 something like that oh okay it is the most played song on my spotify okay for so the last are... five years <laughs> They're getting a lot of money from you. I am at least in their top 0 0.05 fans. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, if you do that uh, two million times, yeah, it's a lot of money. Yes. I guess. Oh no. <laughs> there is um, any special person that you like to talk or you like to meet in a bar and talk to them. I think Torpion that I met today, even though we only had lunch, when we sometimes when we've been at conferences, we haven't gotten much sleep because we would stay up and we would talk. Um, and even though I actually rarely drink alcohol, I find that you can often have very good conversations in bars. Um, you're kind of done with the day. You're a little bit relaxed. Um, but it would probably be him if I should pick one. No. I mean, it's, um, I, mean I, I work as a bartender. Um, and um, you can have nice talks yeah. about, about everything. So this is fun, quite funny till really quite uh, uh, sad. Yeah. I mean, all things are there. So, um, and um, this is also strange. There are nights for the fun and there are also nights for the sad. Yeah. So this is uh, strange. It's a, a strange thing in, in a bar. So sometimes really, you know, this is going to be sad today or whatever. So, or, or my case was like this, no? I find mm -hmm. that because I'm so good at connecting with people, sometimes I go into really deep conversations. Yeah. And sometimes I just listen very deeply. And people will, if you listen properly to people, they will tell you stuff. That is yeah. interesting. You, they will tell you their stories. They will tell you their pains, and they will tell you the good stuff. And I keep being in wonder about how amazing people are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, yeah. And there is the point when they um, maybe want to tell you something that um, that they will not tell, not even the best friend. Yeah. Who, you know, because you are not a known person, you are a third person, and, and you're nice, you're hearing, and, and 
And, and that's why I'm uh, asking you the my lovely question if you have something to confess today. Something to confess. Um, I have not had coaching training until last year. Oh. So all the coaching that I've done over decades has been instinct. And it's sometimes I'll be like, oh, I don't know the theory. Because I'm not very good at remembering that. But what I have is I have a genuine interest in people. I care about them. And I listen. Um, I'm not sure that's much of a confession. But um, well, the thing is, I mean, uh, um, uh, I'm talking now against my business unit that I have because we sell trainings. Um, but um, I mean, someone has uh, have to start doing the material in this training. So, yeah. um, so there are people who are able to create their own um, methods or their own way, and it doesn't mean that this is uh, less worth than uh, established uh, train training. No, but I and, love being in trainings. I love learning new things. Yeah, so, but you, there are many ways how you learn things. Yeah. And I, I, um, I mean, at the end of the day, um, especially with coaching, uh, you need to hear the people. And yeah, and yeah that's, that's, that's the, the things. And even if you have many trainings on that, if you're not able of um, or hearing, <coughs> sorry, of hearing the people, yeah. so that will not help you. No, no. So my last question for you, what is the best place on earth for you? There's a special place for you with a special... So I used to live in Aarhus, um, which is the second biggest town in Denmark, and south of the city there's this, this forest. And it's kind of really close to the water, and then there's like forest and... And there's one place where there is a waterfall. It's only like two meters. Um, but it has the sound of like water trickling. And there's this big rock that is just shaped so it's good to sit on. Okay. And it's, it's such nice. a place of calmness. Mm -hmm. right, that's a special place. And otherwise, I would say my special places is usually with people. Yeah. But you can also be alone, you told that. Yes, I can. And I think this is an important thing to have yeah. both. I mean, I, um, I can also be alone. That's, uh, um, I love people too. I like them very much. Mm. But, um, alone is also nice. Mm. Yeah. Gite, thanks so much. It Thank was you for inviting me. You're welcome, and I hope to see you soon. The latest in November, so late. um, yeah, latest. Yeah, you know, yeah. we never, we never, never know. know. Thanks so much. Thank okay. you. Take care. You too. And, um, see you soon. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.